Welcome to the Chappelle roster of Jewish service in the American Civil War. On behalf of the Chappelle Manuscript Foundation and my colleagues, Alex and Caitlin, I'd like to extend our thanks to Peggy Friedman of the Jewish Genealogical Society of Georgia and Jeremy Katz of the Bremen Museum. We are so grateful for their enthusiasm, cooperation, and tireless effort to promote this event, which is evident by how many of you are here today. So let's get started. Um, before I tell you more about the Chappelle roster, some of you might not be familiar with the organization behind our project, the Chappelle Manuscript Foundation. They're based in Israel uh, with offices in California, and the foundation is dedicated to collecting and exhibiting original manuscripts and historical documents with a focus on unique themes in US history and the Holy Land with emphasis on 19th and 20th centuries. Our research is just one of the many ongoing projects at the foundation. Uh, some of these projects include an exhibition called Mark Twain and the Holy Land, uh, which was at the New York Historical Society until last month. Um, and we have two books in production, one on John F. Kennedy and another one on Abraham Lincoln, and those will be coming out in the near future. Um, if you would like to know more about the foundation, you can go to www.chapelle.org and find out more. Um, we are a small team of six, uh, currently located in West Virginia, that's myself, Montana, that's Caitlin, Massachusetts, that's Alex, and then we have additional researchers in Virginia, California, and Nebraska. We come from different disciplines, uh, museums, public history, historic preservation, genealogy, art history, and Caitlin is a lawyer with a passion for Civil War history. What we all have in common is curiosity and a dedication to bringing this research to the public. As a side note, if you are interested in volunteering with us, we actually um, have a handful of volunteers. Uh, we'd like to hear from you, and at the end, we will give you an email address you can use to contact us and let us know you'd like to help us out. Before I get started on how we got started on this project, I'm going to ask three questions. After each one, I'd like everyone in the audience to use the raise hand feature if your answer is yes. Um, Let's see if this works. Okay, question number one. How many people here know if they have an ancestor that served in the Civil War? Oh, my goodness, look at that. Wow, okay, that's awesome. Excellent, okay. Um, question number two. How many people aren't sure if they have an ancestor uh, that served in the Civil War, but their family uh, was in the United States in the night, at least before the Civil War. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Everybody put their hands down. Uh, question number three How many people have heard of Simon Wolf? Wonderful. Um, let's see here. So, um, for those of you not familiar with Simon Wolf, he was a prominent uh, Washington, D.C. based lawyer um, uh, who was Jewish. If he was alive today, uh, we'd probably call him a social justice warrior because he was exactly that. He also had a special tie to Atlanta. Um, another raise hand opportunity. How many of you know about the Jewish Educational Loan Fund? Excellent. Oh boy, lots of you guys. Oh, that's exciting. Okay. Um, all right, next question. How many of you know that it began back in 1876 as a proposal by the president of the National B'nai B'rith to create a Hebrew orphan's home, which was finally completed in 1889? Excellent. All right. And for those of you, um, Simon Wolf was that president. Um, in 1895, he published a book called The American Jew as Patriot, Soldier, and Citizen. In it, he listed nearly 10,000 names, <clears throat> excuse me, of Jewish Civil War soldiers and sailors. And ever since then, that 10,000 number has become synonymous with Jewish and Civil War. Uh, it was a limited list, however, uh, comprised of the usual military basics, name, rank, and regiment. 
Uh, when I first started on this project uh, nine years ago, I was informed that all the names in Wolf's roster were Jewish and needed no further research other than to confirm their service information. This is probably a good time to mention that I myself am not Jewish. Um, and having done academic research my entire prof professional career, when someone tells me no further research is needed, I assume the opposite is true. So when we started seeing clues that some of the names in Wolf's roster might not be Jewish, I started asking some questions. The first seed of doubt was planted by a Massachusetts soldier named Henry Marks. Good Jewish immigrant name, right? The problem was he was brought up on charges for stealing a ham for his own use. Now, like I said, I'm not Jewish, so I asked around and I was told that dietary restrictions could be lifted during extenuating circumstances. Civil war would certainly qualify as meeting that criteria and that made sense to me. The next anomaly was an obituary for the mother of a soldier named Philip Halpin. The problem was it stated that she'd lived a true Christian life. Um, again, I asked for guidance and I was told that marriage and conversion to the Christian faith was not uncommon. That also made sense. But what really convinced me that Wolf was simply engaging in the 19th century accepted practice of name profiling was the following. Wolf listed uh, in his roster, um, this is just random samples, there's more, um, a guy named Carl Moritz, another guy named Gustav Rosenfeld, and a guy named C.C. Fleck. Now, I have I assume that those are all good Jewish sounding names. The problem is when we did our research, Carl's full name was Carl Christian Moritz. Gustav's middle name was Christian as well. And C.C. Fleck was actually Christian C. Fleck. Okay, last question for hand raising. Raise your hand if there is anyone named Christian in your family tree who's Jewish. I don't see any raised hands, okay. Um, in short, Wolf wasn't being nefarious or duplicitous, but his 19th century work needs a 21st century upgrade. Um, and our mission is to correct the historical record and provide, as best as we can, an accurate accounting of Jews who served in the Civil War. When it goes live, the Chappelle roster will be a free to the public, online, searchable database of Jewish service in the American Civil War. As an aside, when I say soldier, what I really mean is those who served in the Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force. Air Force, that's right. The Civil War era Air Force was known as the Balloon Corps. In addition to the regular military branches, we also have a cabinet member uh, and even a few spies. We often get asked, when will the roster be available? I don't have a definitive date, but the current plan is within the next few years. We've spent years on Union soldiers, uh, and we want to make sure that we give the Confederates uh, the same attention. Uh, Wolf listed far more Union names, but we also believe that he missed more Confederate names than Union names. So we want to make sure we give the Confederates our full attention. Within the database, uh, each soldier will have his own page, uh, which includes, if we have it, uh, his birth and death date and location, a detailed accounting of his military service, the connections, if any, that we know of uh, between him and other individuals in the database. And you're going to find out more about that later when Alex is talking. Um, and marriage, residence, occupation details, and historical documents that provide insight into their lives. Some of our soldiers, uh, like Edmund Lewis Gray Zelensky, get an in-depth soldier story treatment. You can view examples of the soldier stories we've already written on our website. So if you go to chappelle.org, just add a forward slash roster, or you can just find roster in the bar and click on it there. Those historical documents I just mentioned get attached to a soldier's record when we find something cool about them or if we need a proof or evidence uh, for something. We have two objectives when researching the soldiers. Uh, the first one is proof of military service. The second is for the names uh, from Wolf's roster 
evidence that they were in fact Jewish. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We prefer primary source documents, which are defined by the Library of Congress as original documents and objects which were created at the time under study. So let's look at examples of primary source documents organized into three categories. That would be military, public, and personal. Examples of military primary source documents include the list you see here. We find these uh, at the National Archives, websites like fold3.com, and multiple genealogical sites. We build each soldier's military service history as best we can, given the information available to us, and scan and attach records on a case-by-case -case basis. There are two things you should know about Civil War research. Number one, 21st century research of 19th and early 20th century documents is best described, as one of our colleagues used to say, as shooting a moving target from a moving vehicle. Right now, there are more digitized records available than there were this morning when you woke up. Uh, number two, less Confederate records survive the Civil War than Union records. The ones at the National Archives are what the Confederate states gave to the federal government after the war. We know that other records ex exist, however, and we are dedicated to finding them. But less records is a problem. We do not want to exclude someone's ancestor just because there's no known proof that he served. So we are currently brainstorming on how to adapt our methodology to accommodate soldiers with no traditional proof of service. Allow me to give you an example. One of our attendees here today contacted me earlier this week to tell me that her grandfather told her that his father served in the Civil War on the Confederate side. I offered to do some research, see what I could find, and I found a biographical passage written about her grandfather while he was still alive that included the same information that she told me. There's no reason to doubt the story. But unfortunately, her great-grandfather left very few footprints in the historical record, and I haven't yet found evidence of his service during the Civil War. But, this is important, that doesn't mean he didn't serve. Sorry about the double negatives. It is important to us that 125 years from now, our research won't be regarded as similar to Simon Wolfe's. So we will keep working towards an answer on how to get Julius Katz into the Chappelle roster. Next category, public records. These are usually created by government or business entities. They allow us to track soldiers throughout their lives through the historical record. Something to keep in mind with regards to obituaries. Obituaries are the last opportunity to be the person you always wanted to be. So just remember to take the information in them with a grain of salt. And lastly, we love personal records and objects. We find them in union pension records. We find them in archives, libraries, museums, historical and genealogical societies that have collections and in private collections. And we are especially, and I mean this sincerely, especially grateful to descendants who share their family treasures with us. There's something about seeing a signature or looking at an object and feeling that connection to the person connected to that. Um, when we know that they died during the war or died never having married, we often wonder if we are the only ones who remember them. Um, so that wraps up the bird's eye view of the project. And now I'm gonna let Alex and Caitlin tell you about some of the soldiers in our database. Thank you so much. Hi everybody. I'm so excited to be here. So today, Alex and I get to highlight some of our soldiers for you and show you some of the example, some examples of the type of information and the documents we collect, which will be made available to everyone once our database goes live. We've picked soldiers with Georgia connections since most of you are from Georgia, uh, and I'm sure some of you will recognize names and places. First, we have the Solomons family. Simon Wolfe included a section in his book called Brothers in Arms, documenting some families who served during the war. We've taken that concept and run with it. We trace brothers, cousins, in-laws, and non-familial relationships, like friendships, co-workers, neighbors, among many others. Seeing these personal relationships beyond our soldiers' service 
really allows us to have a fuller picture of what these soldiers' lives were like. In the Solomon's family, brothers Abraham Alexander, so you can see if you look uh, on the family tree, top left, Lazar, Joseph M, Moses and Moses Joseph, all served in Georgia regiments during the Civil War. Plus, Moses Joseph's future son-in-law, Joel or Joseph Levenstein, served in Virginia. And you can see him down on the right side of the family tree, right under Moses Joseph. None of these soldiers were listed in Simon Wolfe's book. We believe he had significantly less records, access to records, and fewer sources available to him in the South. So we have already added a lot of previously unrecorded Jewish Confederates and expect to find a bunch more. For those of you familiar with Malcolm Stern's first American Jewish families, he included the Solomon's families in his genealogies as seen here, but he only acknowledged Joseph Solomon's as serving. Lazar, Joseph, and Moses all served together in 1st Olmsted's Georgia Infantry in 1861. Lazar then re-enlisted with Abraham in 1st Symes Georgia Reserves in 1864. The family was originally from Georgetown, South Carolina, which had a significant Jewish population in the early 19th century, and they moved to Savannah before the war. We see a lot of these older Jewish families from the South contributing significant numbers to the cause. It is not uncommon for us to work with families where there are a dozen or more members fighting during the Civil War. There is some of this on the Union side, but a lot of the men we see up north were much more recent immigrants and they don't have the numbers living in America at the point the Civil War broke out. Our job is really exciting, but it can also be challenging and sometimes pretty tragic. A lot of the men we invest our time in learning about had hard lives and some were cut short fighting in the Civil War, killed in action, but also dying of disease, exhaustion, starvation. We hope the work we're doing now in some small way honors those sacrifices. Louis Mares was an immigrant from Bavaria. He came to the United States in 1853 and settled in West Point, Georgia, setting up shop as a merchant. Mares volunteered right at the beginning of the war in the 4th Georgia Infantry. His brother, Daniel Mears, also tried to enlist, but was turned away for poor eyesight. So Daniel stayed back and manned their store. Unfortunately, Lewis was killed in action at Antietam, which took place September 17th, 1862, and which would later be acknowledged as the bloodiest single day of the Civil War. But fortunately for us, Lewis Mares was a prolific writer. So we know a lot more about him and what his life was like than we do with most of our soldiers. He kept a detailed diary during his service, which was published in 1959 by the Chattahoochee Valley Historical Society, and he has letters held by the American Jewish Archives. Additionally, we have copies of Dan Brother Daniel Mares's letters through a descendant who has been working with us telling the story of how a comrade gave Lewis's ring after his death to the governor of Georgia and the governor personally tracked down Daniel to return the ring to him. We collect these resources and use them to find new soldiers, relationships between soldiers, and we'll make them available for everyone to use and learn about these soldiers once our database goes live. I'm gonna switch over to Alex here. Hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about our next soldier, Anselm Stern. Um, through Louis Mares' diary and letters, we know that he and four other Jewish soldiers, Jacob Frieselben, Isaac Heyman, and brothers Levi and Anselm Stern were friends, all from West Point, Georgia, and enlisted together in Company D of the 4th Georgia Infantry. Other primary source documents give us additional information about a soldier's service history, but also valuable insight into other parts of their lives. Here we have this great newspaper article written about Stern. The byline of this article is, this article is a fourth in a series of articles about the fathers of real daughters of the Confederacy in this area. The first paragraph of this article reads, 12-year-old Anselm Stern didn't divide the United States into North and South when he came to America from Germany, but when he settled in America, it was the small Georgia town of West Point, and where the Civil War broke out, his love of the town and his friends there made him aware that his South was being brought under fire. He was already a member of a crack company, the 
the West Point Guards. When Georgia seceded on January 19, 1861, the guards immediately offered themselves to the Confederate government for 12 months. Stern, with such friends as Louis Mares, an uncle, and others in the guards were ordered to Augusta. This article is really great because it tells us not only that Stern was already a member of the West Point Guards when the war began, but it tells us more about his immigration to the United States, his place of residence before the war, and that he had an uncle that served with him. It also mentions Louis Mares again, the soldier that Caitlin has just discussed with us, um, who wrote about his friend Anselm Stern in his diary. From his records, um, military records, we found that Stern was appointed a member of the Brass Band during his service, which is really interesting. And after the war, Stern moved to Albany, Georgia, where he was a charter member of the Jewish congregation. He then moved to Anniston, Alabama, where he was lay reader at Temple Beth El. Another newspaper article we found titled Hebrews in Vital Roles in Affairs in Anniston also has the same photo of Stern that you can see here. Um, it's always so great to find a photograph of a soldier that you're researching. Um, this article lists Stern as an early leader of the synagogue in Anniston. Stern also appears on a roster of charter members of the Jewish congregation of Albany um, from the history of Daughtry County. And a document we always love to find, um, which we were able to find for Anselm Stern, is his obituary. Um, we were lucky to find it, because um, not everyone has one. Um, and his obituary states that few men have passed away in Aniston in recent years, leaving behind such a large number of devoted admirers as were claimed by Anselm Stern. Um, as Adrian mentioned before, an obituary was really the last place that uh, the deceased or their family could present themselves the way that they wanted to be remembered. Um, this lets us know that Stern was admired and he had a lot of friends, but this document also gives us other information, um, such as um, information about his funeral services. They were conducted at the Temple Beth El by Rabbi Einrich of Montgomery, Alabama, and also um, it includes other valuable data to us specifically such as information about his birth, his immigration, his residence at the time of his death, and it also mentions that he served in the Civil War. Stern was an active member in the United Confederate Veterans, and his wife led a chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And these organizations provide us a great way to be able to track guys that were having trouble confirming service for through traditional uh, service records. Um, or if we're having trouble confirming their civilian identity after the war. Um, and then the document that you can see on the right of your screen is a reproduction of the pledge made by Anselm Stern to not escape if he was released from a prisoner of war camp while on a working detail in a Union hospital. So that's also really interesting. Um, the next soldier I wanted to talk about was Joseph Byron Canman. Um, he's brought to you by uh, one of our descendants um, who is in our audience right now, Peggy Friedman. Thank you so much, Peggy. Um, she was instrumental in organiz organizing this uh, meeting today and making everything happen. Um, and she brought us her ancestor. Um, Canman was a Union soldier. He served in the 117th Illinois Infantry as a fifer and then as a drummer, and then he was put on special assignment as a clerk for court-martial tribunals. Um, he was then sent to the Ordnance Department and finally the Adjutant General's Department. Um, this is an example of a trend that we often see, which is using Jewish soldiers as clerks, um, as they often had higher rates of literacy than the general soldiering population at the time. One of the main reasons um, that Canman is a prime example of an outreach success story for us is that without Peggy, uh, we probably would have never known that he was Jewish. Um, he was married in a Methodist wedding ceremony, um, and as far as we can tell, did not live an outwardly Jewish life. However, he is Jewish through his father, and we would never have known this had Peggy not reached out to us and let us know more of her family history. Um, Peggy also informed us that Canman was really considered the black sheep of the family. Um, and we found this to be true when we found a really interesting tidbit about him. Um, Canman began living under the name of Joseph Campbell in 1878 after the war because he claimed that he was trying to escape a debt of $4,000 because he had, and also because he had left his family and didn't want them to uh, find him. So a little scandalous. 
but very interesting. Um, this is a great example of a soldier using an alias after the war, um, which was more common than you may think. Um, people changed their names a lot during this time period. Um, again, this is why it's so important to gather information from descendants um, who will know more about their own family history, obviously, than we will. Um, we also have many examples of soldiers using aliases during the war. Um, one of the main reasons we have found this uh, happening so far um, was that soldiers often wanted to hide military service from their families, um, whether they were under age at the time of the enlisted or they just had really protective parents. Um, many soldiers feared that their families uh, would interfere with their enlistment. Um, and many were afraid that their mothers and fathers would actually show up and drag them home um, from the war. Uh, we have also found a few of examples of soldiers expressing um, that they didn't want their true name to be published in newspapers if they were to die um, because they didn't want to upset their families with details of their death. So um, we want to hear from you. We've been hearing from a couple people in the chat so far, but um, definitely let us know if your ancestors served in the Civil War. Um, when the Chappelle roster goes live, it will be again free and open to the public. Um, each soldier will have their own page with documents we've gathered from a multitude of archival repositories. Um, if we already have your ancestor, you will be able to access all of these documents we found and you'll be able to download them for free. Um, and if we don't have your ancestor, we would love to do research about them for you for free. Um, so please uh, give us their names um, and any information you might have about them. Um, and either way, we, we really want to talk to you. So the best way to do that is to um, email our outreach coordinator, Eliza. Um, her email is on the screen, eliza at chappelle.org. Um, so we can make sure that your ancestors are honored for their patriotic service. Um, so now we're going to address any questions um, that were asked during the presentation. I'm not sure if we have any, um, but please uh, use the Q&A function at the either the bottom or the top of your screen. I believe it's near the hand raise function that you guys were practicing earlier um, to ask us any additional questions you might have about any of the content of our presentation or um, any, any further questions you guys have. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Oh, look at all those questions lining up. Okay. Um, uh, you want me to take uh, Peggy's question? Sure. Go okay. for it. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, so Peggy asked, is there a list of soldiers on the Chappelle roster so that we can know if we are sending you the name of someone that you have already researched? So the answer to that is no, but for very good reason in that literally our list changes daily. So there would be no way for us to- um, We want to hear from you whether we've already researched your ancestor or not. So. Exactly. So, um, so we just want to hear uh, from you guys. So, so Jeremy uh, just asked, I know you still have a lot of research to do, but what is your current tally, both Union and Confederate? So um, let me start by saying that when we, We've been going through the wolf names, um, and to date, we've already found 800 duplicate names. Um, so that doesn't mean that, you know, they were Jewish or not. Those are just duplicate names where somebody served in multiple regiments, um, and they're listed multiple times uh, as individuals. So we have worked really, really, really hard to stay away from what we call the numbers game. Um, because um, we feel like um, there are still so many names that we haven't found, especially on the Confederate side. Um, and once we finish our analysis of Wolf, um, we'll have a better, we'll be better able to address the number question. But just so you know, right now, um, Wolf names fall into three categories. They are either Jewish, they are either not Jewish, and there's a handful of those, um, or we have a category called Jewish according to Wolf. And what that means is we have not yet found um, anything to give us direction one way or the other. So until we get all of those names uh, assigned a status, um, we won't really be able to uh, address the numbers question. So I'm sorry that was a non-answer, but. <laughs> 
We're working on it. That's yeah, it. we are working, working on, on it. it. <laughs> um, so uh, Sharon asked, do you plan to connect your database to Ancestry.com and other genealogical websites? So I'm assuming most of you all are familiar with Jewish Gen and Jewish Gen's partnership with Ancestry. So what we would, we have discussed this um, with people at the foundation and we feel like it's too early at this juncture to make a decision one way or the other. Um, but my guess is if we were going to do that, we would do it through Jewish Gen. That seems to be, you know, the best way to do that. So, and I've had some conversations along those lines um, with the people at Jewish Gen. So, but I think that's a, uh, but regardless, um, because our um, database will be free to the public, um, you know, it, 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 even if it stands up being a standalone uh, and we don't end up partnering with Ancestry, you won't need to worry about having to, you know, do a membership fee. So it'll still be free. Also, I just wanted to grab Sandy asked a question in the comments section, and I just want to address that really quickly. Sandy asked if we list deserters, and we do. Um, and we don't judge. <laughs> um, we have guys who enlisted and were around for five days. We have guys who deserted after, you know, almost f four or five years or four years of service. Um, we're totally non-judgmental. If you served a day in the military, you were officially on the rolls. We include you. So <laughs> desertion was very prevalent during the Civil War, and a lot more soldiers deserted than you would ever imagine. Um, yes. <laughs> and came back a lot, too. So A lot, yeah. Uh, President Lincoln, at one point, issued a proclamation allowing deserters to come back, and if you would fulfill the remaining time left on your enlistment period, they'd totally forgive your desertion. Um, so we have a bunch of guys, too, who left at some point and then come back and actually end up fulfilling their service honorably. So... <laughs> And we also have um, um, people who were said to have deserted, which was actually paperwork issues. In mm -hmm. other words, if you're not there at roll call, you know, somebody's going to assume you deserted. Well, you may have been detached and the guy taking ro roll call wasn't informed enough. Mm -hmm. You could have been in, you know, the, the sick, you know. Uh, the and we see a lot of that in in the official records things being corrected later on um but there's a lot of chaos in war so yeah. um, we also have a question in the comments about how much we've used robert rosen's book to help with our research and we definitely have referenced rosen um we're adding to some of his information he's been helpful so we appreciate his work one of the things to keep in mind about uh, Robert Rosen's work is that when he did his book, the internet was in its infancy. So yeah. the difference between then and now is huge. Um, but um, we absolutely have been in touch with him um, and he's actually pretty excited about what we're doing. And so, um, but one of our very first objectives uh, was to make sure that every name in uh, Rosen's book um, has been researched uh, by us. And, and a lot of them, you know, um, were also in Wolf, uh, but some of them that we didn't know. Um, and so they are now in the database, absolutely. Any resource like that that we can get our hands on, we, we definitely try to vet and, and include as much information as we can. Absolutely. Um, looks like next question in the Q&A um, is from Rebecca. It says, was what Jewish soldiers said about slavery markedly different than non-Jewish soldiers? Were there any Jewish religious overtones? Hmm, and I see a couple of upvotes on that. Um, trying to think. We have a mix of yeah, that, and honestly, it runs the gamut kind of the way I think the entire American population kind of ran the gamut. We definitely have guys coming over who were 48ers in, Europe who are fighting their own rebellions and they come over and like they tend to be very staunchly anti-slavery abolitionists you know it goes against their intellectual uh, belief in equality and access um, we also have some Jewish slaveholders so there is definitely a mix I think the biggest thing that we found about our Jewish citizens at this period of time that doesn't always get talked about is there's a lot of assimilation to the societies they're living in. And so our Southern Jews 
like fought for the Confederacy and some specifically point out and say, hey, I don't believe in slavery, but I believe in my home and this is my home now. Um, some of them did have slaves or some of them were more okay with the practice. A lot, most of them, we don't have records on how they felt about it, to be honest. Um, but we do have some like noted abolitionist types from up north. Uh, it, it definitely runs the range just like the entire population of the United States at that point. Yeah, and um, just going back to one of the soldiers that I had mentioned during the presentation, Anselm Stern, he um, specifically in uh, the article that we found written about him said that he wasn't really concerned about matters between North and South, but that he was very devoted to West Point, Georgia. And if West Point, Georgia was going with the Confederacy, that's the way he went because he was about West Point, Georgia. So again, as Caitlin just said, like it was a lot of going with the community that you were in and, and wanting to be on that side. So let's see. All right. So, all right, Peggy. Um, Peggy asked, which archives have you been to? Uh, have we visited for research? Is this an area where you are using volunteers? Yes, ma'am. So... Uh, <laughs> We remember that part where I said we're a really small team of six um, at we don't have the ability to travel and thanks to COVID-19 now we're not even allowed to so um, <laughs> yeah that kind of changes everything but absolutely um, we because here's the thing that keep in mind about um, um, archives libraries and historical societies they are limited, um, the smaller they are, uh, the less budget they have. And we know, um, because I've been in the museum world for you know 25 years, that there are absolutely valuable resources um, in these tiny museums and archives yeah. and libraries all over the country. And they tend to collect the families, um, you know, business histories and, and uh, genealogy histories and whatnot. And so there are tiny towns in all over the South where, there, where Jewish former soldiers, veterans, were um, very prominent members of society. We would love, um, if you know of a small institution that has collections absolutely. about these, absolutely. If you want to go there and, you know, then get in touch with us and let us know what they have, you know, then we, I, I just actually was in Richmond, Virginia, and um, went to the, um, uh, let's see, it's, I'm trying to remember, so it's the Virginia Museum of Culture and History, which now has um, a lot of the Confederate records there. And I had the opportunity to go through some records um, that it was like, wow, there's all our guys. Um, so yeah, and, and so I wasn't able to scan anything um, at that time. Uh, but we'll definitely go back. So the answer is yes. Please reach out to <laughs> Eliza and let us know where you live and what you want to do. And we will absolutely put you uh, put you to work at our regiment, 100%. Okay, uh, I see one from Megan. My grandfather immigrated in 1864 to Chicago. I think he served in the Civil War, but I'm not sure. So again, uh, definitely email us, like we said, Eliza, E-L-I-Z-A, at Chappelle.org. Um, we will 100% look into it. So um, like, tell us everything you got. We're pumped. <laughs> Peggy had a question about, uh, do you have any tips for identifying men with the same name? You know what? I think we should do an entire mm -hmm. webinar now that we've figured this out about... Yeah. <laughs> that very topic because we deal with this all the time I was doing it yesterday I was doing it yesterday and honestly the biggest suggestion I can say about that is don't think resources won't be useful um I had a set of brothers who were in Louisiana and I was trying to confirm if the fourth brother was this Jewish gentleman living in New York City by 1868, and I was digging around and I couldn't find any reference to you know, family. And suddenly his naturalization papers had a reference to his earlier application for citizenship in Natchitoches, Louisiana, and it's signed by one of his brothers once I find Louisiana papers. So uh, it's a lot of digging, it's a lot of census work, it's a lot of directories, which are Adrian's favorite reference. Uh, she is the queen of finding people in them. Um, 
newspapers are great. Wills are an amazing source for uh, finding family trees. People don't always think about wills, but a lot of the time people would lay out their entire family to make sure that their assets would be disposed of to someone related to them, no matter when they died. Um, so you'll get like nephews, nieces, brothers, cousins, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, we could definitely teach an entire, entire seminar on this. So. And that being said, if you are having trouble identifying um, someone in your family that has a very common name, we'd love us. to help you. So yeah. again, definitely email us because we, we do it a lot. So we've had a lot of practice. So definitely let us help you. We would love to help you figure it out. And I have confirmed that there are no extant copies of the city directory for New Orleans in Louisiana from 1861 to 1864. And uh, so if anybody finds one, call me. Don't email yeah, me. Yeah, let, let Adrian know, please. <laughs> um, looks like Dana asked, have you come across any soldiers from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, her hometown? I'm going to be honest with you. We have not done a ton of work in Alabama right now. I'm currently in Louisiana. Alex is in South Carolina. Um, so I think yes. I would be surprised if we don't have. <laughs> yeah. I would be shocked if we didn't have, because that was already like a trade town. So. Let's just say yes, but then don't ask us who. <laughs> <laughs> Come back for that answer. <laughs> Oh, I said, uh, Adrian, the uh, last question um, yes. Jay had was, what was the name of the archive you mentioned in Richmond? Okay, so the reason I was kind of stuttering about it is, um, so there are, um, there's, so there's three institutions um, in uh, Richmond. There's the newly opened, um, and I hope I'm getting these names exactly right. I believe it's the American Civil War Museum, and they have two locations. Then there's the uh, Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And then there's the um, um, Daughters of the Confederacy uh, Museum. So when I went to Richmond, I contacted all of them. And in the process of setting up the American Civil War Museum, um, they were trying to figure out what was the best place for the records to, to reside. And by that, I mean um, that had the best security, the best place for people to view them. And, it, and I believe, if I'm correct, it was determined that they would um, be best uh, held at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. They have um, a large part of the collections um, are still being processed. And so um, I was allowed to look at some of them, which was, uh, quite gracious of them. Um, but like I said, I wasn't able to scan anything. Um, and so, but those records aren't available to the public because they're still being processed to make them available to the public. Now, I had been in touch with the Daughters of the Confederacy uh, Museum um, for when, when we, we first reached out to them, like six years ago, something like that. Sounds great. Right? Mm -hmm. And so they had all these records that they said they were processing um, to make available to the public. And I would check back periodically and they were never available. They were never available. What I found out a couple of months ago is that um, the, their records are from the uh, origin of the Daughters of the Confederacy. So they don't actually uh, include Confederate soldier records. So there was no reason for me to go there and look at their stuff. So um, I can, I, I actually, you know, a lot of what I was looking at, at at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture were actually city directories of Richmond. And I was just taking iPhone pictures because then that gives me an idea of who was living in the city. So when we get to Virginia, we'll have an idea. Um, one of the things we might want to mention um, about the Confederate records is the whole naming convention for the soldiers and the whole IJ issue. Do you guys want to talk about that? You know, how if you see somebody named Jay Levy. It might be I Levy, really. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The handwriting at the time, um, it was mixed up a lot, I's and J's. I just had a soldier I was working on 
last week actually, whose name I think was his name was Isaac Moses, and his uh, was listed as J Moses in uh, many documents, and I was able to, yeah, find that it was actually this Isaac Moses. Yeah, it's, and unfortunately, in the Confederates, a lot more with than with the Union records, they love initials, and it's like, could you just write his name? Please tell me his full first name, and. Um, I, I don't know why, but we definitely see that a lot more with the Confederates in the Union. You rarely see just initials. Um, so yeah, it can be it can be tricky. You have to get a little creative. You have to know like a cursive F could look like a cursive S, that kind of thing. Um, L's and S's. L's and S's, really bad. Yeah, um, yeah. So we do we do a lot of work trying to decipher that. Uh, German handwriting keys, if you're working with recent immigrants, can be amazing. Uh, deciphering, especially like signatures and stuff, we've done a lot of that work. Uh, so yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, Barbara asked a question about what have we found in synagogue archives. Um, it's interesting. Uh, some synagogues, um, you know, have made their uh, collections available online. Um, mm -hmm. I've talked to some registrars um, and some sextons at other synagogues where their marriage and uh, burial and birth records are in warehouses. And so, um, you know, there's only six of us, so we're kind of limited. So. If you happen to know of a synagogue that has- Yeah, if you're a member of a synagogue that you know has archives or collections and you wanna go look around for us or you know introduce us to who's in charge of their archives, that would be amazing. We've worked on, worked with a synagogue in Richmond so far, a synagogue in Philadelphia. Um, that is definitely one of our major outreach points. Uh, Eliza's been working- Yes. Contacting a lot of synagogues because we know they have such re rich resources, um, especially for these guys. We can't find a lot of documentation. Generally, obviously, if they're hanging out in a synagogue, you know they're Jewish, and that's amazing. So, exactly. so, but yeah, again, we we can use your help. Absolutely. We have a question from Howard um, about uh, South Carolina soldiers and how many um, that we found and in Greenville in particular. Um, so I am currently working in South Carolina um, and the names, uh, I can't give you an exact number yet. It changes literally every day. Um, we have at least hundreds of soldiers yeah. that are from South Carolina, maybe more. Um, we're not sure yet. Um, Greenville, uh, I can't look right now while I'm sitting here, but we definitely <laughs> have at least a few soldiers from Greenville. It's um, like Tuscaloosa. Yeah, ex yeah exactly. <laughs> um, Same answer. But yes, we have tons of soldiers from South Carolina. And since I've been working in the state uh, with the names that we already have had, um, I've been able to add tons of new soldiers that um, Wolf missed in his roster. Um, we have a lot of families that had um, maybe one brother listed by Wolf, and he had four or five other brothers that also served with him that were missed by Wolf. So um, we're adding every day, and um, we love to see new names. So if you know of anyone else in South Carolina, yeah, let us know. <laughs> well, you know, one, one of the resources that gave me a really good understanding of, of how it was in the South was there was a diary accountant, and I don't remember, I don't believe it was by a Jewish soldier, but um, they talked about, in fact, I know it was a Union uh, non-Jewish soldier, and he talked about his regiment coming into Savannah and how the only males in Savannah at that moment were old, blind, and crippled men and males in short pants, i.e. children. And what that visually created for me was this this idea of did you really want to be the only able-bodied man in your town who wasn't in a regiment and I'm pretty sure that answer is no so if you have these really large families mm -hmm. and that you know so we're seeing in families you know all the brothers all the fathers all the uncles you know all the cousins um my expectation in the South is, um, you know, within a family that's going, you know, that's going off to war, I would be surprised to find an able-bodied male who wasn't in a regiment. Like that would surprise me more. Uh, well, than and the Confederacy had a hefty draft as yes. well. Um, the Union had a draft. 
it happened and then it was kind of flowed. The Confederate had multiple waves of drafting people. They kept expanding the age limits of, you know, or the age range of people they were pulling in. Um, and even if you weren't able-bodied to serve, once they figured out you had potentially skills, they still wanted you. So like we have a guy who was in his 40s, he gets drafted. They find out he's a shoemaker. It's like he can't, can't march. He's not able-bodied enough to actually fight. They send him to Richmond to make shoes. So a lot more guys end up getting pulled in to the Confederacy that way than we have on the Union side as well. So. Right. Right. Um, are you including men in your list who served during the war in a position other than being a soldier in a regiment? My great grandfather, David Mayer, served as a supply officer for the governor of Georgia. Right. So I've read about David Mayer. Very cool guy. That's awesome. We are currently kind of figuring out how we want to include people like that if they were officially enlisted into the Confederate Army as a supply officer. So, like, they worked with um, the. Uh, Department of Subsistence um, or the Quartermaster Department, and they're actually officers within those. They definitely are in the database. There's no question about that. Uh, we also have guys like Sutlers whose names we are collecting. We're really interested in them. We're in the process of determining how to display them in our database, how to make that information available. Uh, we need to do, we're in the process of researching David Mayer. So if you have more information and you want to talk to us, we'd love to talk to you about him because we're figuring out which of those categories he fits into now. <laughs> and um, this is purely on a technical level. Um, we, so we've added people like David to our Sutler list. So we have Sutlers, we have businesses, um, blockade runners, <laughs> blockade runners. Exactly. Um, and so, and again, this is pure, this is this also addresses how do we put in soldiers who have no service records into our database. So the way our database is structured is we have to have information about the regiment um, to fill out the records. So um, so it's also kind of a technical issue. But what <laughs> I'm confident of is that. Um, you know, David Mayer being a perfect example, we absolutely would love to have the information and we will, we may turn it into a related to soldier stories, you know, kind of thing. Um, we've, we've got a lot of ideas about um, how to, how to um, share what we've collected in terms of stories, uh, not just straight up data. So while we may not have them in our database, we may, you know, do a whole treatment of them on the website as a story. So that's a possibility in the future. Yeah, yeah, we recognize these are important contributions to acknowledge as well. And we definitely like want to include them. Like Adrian said, we're just in process. <laughs> oh, yeah, one last question from Jeremy. Uh, did the South have substitutes as did the Yankees? Yes, the North and the South mm -hmm. uh, both had uh, substitutions as um, something that they practiced. Yes, yeah, 100%. Or to be able to get a little more bounty to serve for someone else. Exactly. So, yep. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely day. Stay safe. Stay inside, okay? Absolutely. And contact Eliza and yes. talking to, it should get you all talking directly to us. So that would be amazing. We want to hear from everybody. So yes. we'd love to do more research on your <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Okay, bye-bye. Stay all safe. Right. Thank you.